This is Authentic. All right, welcome to the show. We're here talking with Mike Paco Benitez, F-15 Strike Eagle Weapon Systems Officer. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you being here. All right, well, today we're going to talk about the F-15 EX. But before we get into the EX, let's talk about the F-15 itself, the base eagle, where it came from, and how it evolved. Uh, Mike, or Paco, as I'll call you, uh, why don't you talk us through that? Yeah, so the the tweet-level summary is that in the 1960s, the Soviet Union uh, shocked the West with an aircraft called the MiG-25. It was uh, is an interceptor, and it could fly Mach 2, to Mach 2.5, and then up to Mach 3 with some uh, very lim- uh, detrimental to his mm-hmm. engines. And that had shocked the Pentagon into developing a counter to the MiG-25. And so the requirements uh, for the F-15, what became the F-15, were largely based on the MiG-25. Now, at the time, they didn't know what it could and couldn't do. They just saw a fighter type of aircraft going very, very high, very, very fast. And so that led to the requirements. So the requirements for the F-15 um, led to a contract in 1969. That's how old it was. But it went from uh, concept to requirements in about 1967 on contract in 1969. And then it was operational by 1975. So it was a pretty quick program. And the whole premise of the program is we want a... Uh, we want a massive radar to go intercept these fast, high fighters from the Soviet Union. And you want to carry big missiles, and it has to fly Mach 2.5. So that led to a very big, over-engineered, aerodynamically stable design. And when the aircraft was designed, it didn't have you know uh, computers back then. And so it's a lot of slide rule and pencil math. And so what, you, what it led to is a pretty well-engineered, enduring design. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting aeronautical features in it, most of which I, I can't remember anymore. Uh, but it led to a uh, the first thing you notice at the time when it came out, uh, the people who were uh, the guys were flying the Century Series and the uh, and the Phantom. The first thing they noticed is like, wow, that thing is big. It is a big aircraft. We like to call it the uh, the flying tennis court. So we have some <laughs> you guys who used to fly the F-16 that come over to the F-15, and they're you know they turn around when they're like you know flying BFM or dogfighting, and they go, "Oh my God, it's like a flying tennis court behind me. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a big target." Uh, and and that's kind of sets the stage. Like the Raptor is a very very large aircraft as well. Uh, yeah. And, and there's a reason why it's they're they're comparable size, comparable missions. Yeah. Uh, but the F-15, you know, it's, it's a big aircraft. It's got big, big wings, and it's got uh, it, it actually has a pretty low wing loading. So the weight to wing ratio, uh, based on the, how much uh, surface area is in the wings, it allows it uh, to be pretty maneuverable at very high speeds and high altitudes. And uh, it's got some pretty powerful engines, which gives it a, a high thrust to weight ratio. So that's kind of how the whole F-15 program uh, began. And it it really was a quantum leap, right? Because you go back to the Century series, and they were pretty optimized for each of their roles. And the F-4 was a multi-mission or the start of the sort of multi-mission aircraft. But this was something entirely new, something that outperformed everything out there. And as it turned out, outperformed the MiG-25. Because as we found out in, was it 75? Uh, I'll let you tell that story. But we found out that uh, in that case, the bear that we thought was 10 foot tall and bulletproof wasn't. That's right. It was. It was about the time we were fielding it. We had the uh, we had the, the the defector at the Big Twenty Five, and I actually figured out it actually it couldn't do anything that we thought it could do. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, but that that set the stage. The F fifteen set the stage for what became retroactively referred to as a fourth generation fighter. Mm-hmm. So the the things that set it apart from we'll call it the third generation at the time. Um, and actually, let's just zoom out a little bit. Yeah. So if you go back to the first generation, the first generation of uh, jets had jet engines. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of where you start. <laughs> World War II fighter with jet engines, essentially. Yeah, yeah you get your, like, your, your ME-262s. And yeah, you, you sweep a wing here and there, but yeah. That's right. Yeah, your, yeah. your early Korean War. And then you get to the second generation of fighters, which is now I have my engine technology has matured. My airframe and aeronautical understanding has matured. So now I can go supersonic and I have some, some limited avionics. So I have a, a maybe a range finding radar. I have some very limited air to air missiles. And this kind of describes the century series fighters. Mm-hmm. So they learn a lot. There's a, there's a lot of stuff going on. 
And then you get to the third generation of fighters, which is kind of the advent of the multi-role fighter. So I can build one aircraft and I can put a whole bunch of different things on it. I can put different uh, systems in it. And then through training, I can use it for different things at the time. And so the F-4 is probably the, the hallmark example of a third generation fighter. And so the fourth generation fighter, what that brought was basically microchips. So the advent mm -hmm. of the microchip and that allowed things like synthetic aperture radar or pulse Doppler radar where I can look down, shoot down, where before you couldn't, if you were uh, an interceptor and you were looking at a target that was below you, the signal processing at the time wouldn't allow you to dig it out of the, the noise, the background clutter of the ground. And so when we talk about look down, shoot down, that is a, a fourth generation and beyond capability, uh, thanks to the advent of uh, microchips and there's some material sciences for uh, how the, you know, the antenna arrays are built. And so that's kind of where that all starts with avionics and you get some sensors and, and now we have even more powerful engines. And so now we can actually have positive thrust to weight ratio. So I can, I can accelerate in the vertical in some low fuel uh, instances. Mm -hmm. And so if you see some pictures of like the, uh, the F-15 going vertical, uh, some of the newer fighters, like that's, that is kind of the, the hallmark of that as a fourth generation fighter. Then you get into fifth generation fighters. And I would say that the, the number one thing that distinguishes them is the signature. So they're built to have a different passive radio frequency signature. Mm -hmm. uh, the other things are, are kind of happy to glad. So it's got sensors, it's got fusion. Those are things that you can put on other aircraft. But the one thing that actually makes it different is it accounts for a signature, specifically a very certain type of signature. And that is so important because when you get into defining what will become a sixth generation fighter, you know, I, I could, I could describe what the probably think it's going to be right now, which it's going to be, it's going to have no tail. So yeah. to, to quantify what a sixth generation fighter is, I don't think it'll have a tail. No country in the world is going to build a, a sixth generation fighter with a tail. I think there's a half dozen different uh, efforts going on around the world. None of them have tails. There's mm -hmm. a reason for that. Um, you're going to have open mission systems and you're going to have digital engineering. So you have a digital twin. You can iterate on the sensors, the hardware and the software really, really quickly. And you have an inherently um, wider band, lower signature design. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the generations in a nutshell. And I, and I say that with a big asterisk. There's actually no official designation of those generations that I just made up. But <laughs> there is about four <laughs> or five different frameworks that do exist. And they're, they're roughly what I've just described. Right. And so really that jump from fourth to fifth, and don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but that fourth to fifth yep. really comes down to some stuff that are baked in, if you will. Like you can't redesign the airframe to an enormous extent. And a lot of that discrete passive signature you're talking about has to do with physical geometry. It does. And, 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 and I yeah. say, and that's one spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get into, into that discussion if you want. So there's there's a, what would you call like uh, stealth? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, uh, you would that is a radio frequency, a narrow band, narrow as aspect radio frequency capability. Mm -hmm. So at a certain frequency range, at a, at a certain range from that emitter, at a certain angle, I can control what that reflectivity is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not all aspect. That's not all frequencies, and that's not all ranges. And so we develop tactics to kind of maximize that capability now that that's a two-sided equation though so uh that's number one that's only rf so there's mm -hmm. an ir spectrum there's an audible spectrum there's a magnetronic spectrum like there's if you're putting metal in the air and it's moving through and disturbing molecules it it is it, there is something that is emitting there's a signature um, there. yeah there is a signature right so that's part of it and the other part of it is the enemy gets a vote and so the, right. the systems that the enemy is developing <laughs> uh i would say have have advanced dramatically in the past 15 years uh, and to the point of of you're seeing like there's there's other generational leaps and you know it, it, tactics and technology development to kind of a cat and cat and dog game so i'm going to do this there's going to be a counter to it there's a counter counter to it and it kind of goes back and forth so right. it's not a you know, I've heard it called the price of entry. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that. Uh, believe that there's a time and a place for attributes and platform capabilities. And as it turns out, if you have you know an entire football team of quarterbacks and you yeah. put all of them on the field, you're probably going to lose. Yeah, it's not going to work quite quite as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so taking that, let's roll back to the F-15 in its you know the A model, 
right? We'll go back to the beginning. As you said, solidly fourth gen because it defined fourth gen in a lot of ways. So there's, uh, I don't know if there's A models flying in anyone's inventory anymore, but we'll keep stuff uh, on the open source level just to be careful throughout the discussion. You know, what did the F-15 bring to the table in terms of sort of height, speed, range? We talked about speed a little bit already, but height, speed, range, and ability to engage. Yeah, so uh, the first thing, it had power. Uh, so it could uh, it could accelerate very quickly. I think it was one of the first fighters that had a thrust-to-weight ratio that was positive, so it could accelerate in the vertical. The, the second thing that it had was speed. So it had an actual stated requirement for Mach 2.5 based on the MiG-25. Right. So they had to design an airframe to go Mach 2.5, which at the time introduced a whole bunch of other engineering challenges. So if you notice on the, on the F-15, the, the inlets, they actually mm -hmm. move. So they move up and down and then inside the inlets, there's a bunch of trap doors with perforations that move around. And the reason is in a turbine engine, the process of, of thrust is suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Well, you can suck all the air in if you're going, you know, Mach 2.5, but you can't compress uh, supersonic right. air. It's uncompressible. So just like the SR-71 had those big nozzles, it had had those, those big cones. Those cones were there to slow the air down enough between the, the intake and the front of the engine to get it subsonic so it could be compressed. So the F-15 has a series of uh, inlet ramps that move around, and there's a flight control computer that does it all for us, and that allows us to go faster. Uh, like the F-16 has a fixed inlet, and so it's it's speed limit of, of just what it can do by just design. Right. Now, that's not saying that it's tactically useful to go Mach 2.5, <laughs> but the right. aircraft <laughs> the aircraft can go Mach 2.5, that is a, it, it does. It's yeah. not a, it's not a glossy brochure. Right. In, in fact, the F-15 SA, we'll get a little bit ahead, but the F-15 SA, which is the, uh, which the EX is based off of in the, for flight sciences, they had to actually validate that requirement still with the new mm -hmm. engines and the new airframe. <laughs> so they had to go actually in, out and take it to, uh, to the limit. So sure it could do. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it got there, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's not really where you want to live tactically. But right. I want to say I got to Mach 2.9, like seven something. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yep, that's good enough. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or Mach 2.49, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we're talking about a, a production aircraft. This is not a, you know, specialty one-off or a, an X-plane or something. We're talking about making production aircraft that, you know, understood. They're probably not all going to hit you know, 2.49 because various issues, but they're going to be doing over two. So, so it's a fast plane. You know, it's a capable plane. We talked about the look down, shoot down radar, pretty decent range on that radar, and then carried a decent host of missiles, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it can carry. Uh, so the EX carries 12 as is, and then it has some expansion options in the glossy brochure that the Air Force didn't buy. <laughs> but it does; it can carry 12. Yeah, I've seen it with 12. It carries them. Yep. It, it's a lot. I mean, the Raptor carries, you know, carries six long range and then two short range. The EX can carry 12 long range or can carry a mix of them. Uh, it's really just kind of choose your own adventure at that point. But beyond the rails and, and the swappability is the fact that they're external. Uh, if and when a larger longer range missile makes mm -hmm. makes an appearance in the future um there are rails in the sky to put it on right whereas you're not going to be able to squeeze that inside an f-22 you're not going to squeeze that inside an f-35 because uh, the yeah, in, in one of those sad stories we built uh the the air force of the u.s military basically designed the f-22 around the aim 120 and the AIM-120 AIM was an early 1980s design. Right. So we were uh, we were constrained by just the energetics that are possible to fit in that much of a weapons bay. Right. And so when you go back to that first generation or, or really the, uh, what would you call them? The light gray eagles, right? The the A, B, C. Yeah. Uh, we call them the, the C, C model. model. Everyone's either C yeah. model or the light gray or the eagle, depending on what side you're on. Yeah. yeah, the light gray. You know, you started back there with eight missiles and a gun, which seemed like plenty back then. And you mentioned the EX is up to 12, and we'll talk about that EX development. Thanks for listening to this authentic snapshot. 
If you'd like to hear more, head over to AuthenticMedia.io to hear the rest of this episode and explore our authentic content.